Hello everyone, welcome. This is Joe Minardi, one of the faculty docs in the emergency department and director of emergency ultrasound. The goal today is to learn a little bit about the FAST exam. Here's what we're going to talk about. Indications, why are you going to do it in the trauma bay? We'll touch a little bit on ultrasound physics, then we'll hit on how you get the good images, standard views, techniques, and um, some of the things that get in your way and make the FAST exam harder. And then most importantly, we we'll talk about how the FAST can help you make decisions in the trauma patient. So why? Who cares about the FAST? Why does it matter? Well, the bedside diagnostic tools that you have at your disposal for the trauma patient are a little bit limited. History can tell you a lot. Physical exam. And then you've got the diagnostic peritoneal lavage, which is a good tool, very accurate tool. Um, but invasive, has some downsides. So uh, we don't do it as much anymore. But... Uh, Still sometimes the FAST exam can give us a lot of the same information without the invasiveness and the other risks that go along with the DPL. The FAST exam is a great tool. It's ultrasound. You can do it at the bedside. You can do it quickly uh, with some experience and practice. It's very accurate and you can repeat it if something goes wrong with really no downside. It doesn't have any radiation like CT scan. There's no contrast to give you contrast induced nephropathy and it's in the realm of imaging. It's very cheap. Other reasons, well you've all seen headlines like this where we're radiating our patients, they walk out of the hospital glowing after trauma, maybe we need to cut down on our CT scans a little bit. CT is a great tool, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not bashing the CT scan, but maybe we could do a little bit less of them. When we're talking about the FAST exam, it's important to keep in mind, you can make four diagnoses with the FAST exam. Pneumothorax, hemothorax, hemopericardium, and hemoperitoneum, that is it. If you're trying to make other diagnoses beyond this, you're stretching the limits of what the ultrasound can do with, do for you in the trauma bay. So, you know, we're talking about indications here. Who should get a FAST exam? This is an easy answer. Every trauma patient. Why? Because the FAST exam gives you additional information over your history and physical, over your primary survey. So you should do it as part of your primary survey and help you make some of your decisions saying this again for emphasis. This is a very important point. Four diagnoses that you can make with a FAST. Pneumo, hemothorax, blood around the heart, or blood within the abdomen. That's it. So the FAST exam has its most critical role in the unstable patient. This is the patient who has a blood pressure of 80 over palp, or the patient who's very altered with a heart rate of 140. This is where the FAST exam can immediately tell you why the patient is in shock and what's the best thing you can do about it. And it can tell you, do you need to do a chest tube? Do you need to do pericardiocentesis or just open the chest and do a thoracotomy? Or do you need to do a laparotomy? And going back up to chest tube there for a second, often if they're unstable and you see pneumothorax then you probably want to do a needle thoracostomy first then followed by the chest tube. Now in the stable patient, the FAST exam in the stable patient is less well defined. There's emerging literature to suggest its role. I'll give you my opinion, but it's not completely evidence-based opinion. I still think the FAST exam should be part of the primary survey even in every stable patient because you can make diagnoses rapidly at the bedside that you cannot make with history and physical exam alone. It can give you a baseline so if something changes with the patient's status you can repeat the FAST later and see if something's changed. And give you extra information about the patient, what's going on with them, so that maybe you can be more selective in who gets a CT scan and maybe who doesn't need to have a CT scan right away. Now, of course, you know, I love ultrasound. I'm ultrasound director. That's what I do. That's what I talk about. But I would be dishonest if I didn't tell you about some of the limitations. It's ultrasound, so it's dependent on how good you are at doing it, so it's operator dependent. A little bit of practice, a little bit of skill, um, the operator dependent piece of it can be overcome. It's patient dependent. Sometimes our patients come in with blood and glass and dirt. They're tender. They have open wounds. So these things make the patient harder to ultrasound. However, as the operator becomes more skilled, the patient factors become less of an issue. Uh, other limitations, even in the best hands, no matter how good you are, a perfect patient, the way we're talking about the FAST exam evaluation of pneumothorax, 
it's not going to tell you how big it is. You're never going to say, oh, based on this fast exam, ultrasound of the chest, this is a 28.6% pneumothorax. It's not going to happen. It's yes pneumothorax, no pneumothorax, no pneumothorax. That's it. If you have injuries in the retroperitoneum, you can miss those on ultrasound, so if you have suspicion for those, you need to do something else. And parenchymal injuries. Even though you see blood within the abdomen, the ultrasound isn't that accurate for telling you, yes, that blood is coming from the spleen or coming from the liver, from the bowel. In fact, I don't suggest you even try to diagnose that with your FATS exam. So those are some of the limitations, but again, information in addition to your history and physical that can help you at the bedside. So we're going to talk about how to do it. I'm going to remind you a few things about ultrasound, how it works, how to do it. An approach to the exam that can be help you be more efficient, and then most importantly, how to use the information that the FAST exam gives you. A couple of reminders about just ultrasound in general as it pertains to the FAST exam. A couple of things you got to make sure are right as you start out. Make sure your machine is set up right. Make sure it's turned on. Uh, make sure you know how to turn it on. And then once it's turned on, make sure it's in roughly the right setting, some kind of abdominal or FAST setting. And make sure you know these buttons, depth button and gain button, and probably the store button. You'll see 150 other buttons on the ultrasound machine, but if you can find the depth, the gain, and the store, you can do 90% of what you want to do with ultrasound. You can ignore the rest and don't be intimidated by all those buttons. Getting that setting right, uh, pretty important because, you know, if you put it on, turn the ultrasound on and it's on a DVT setting, nothing is going to look right and you're not going to make any sense of what you're trying to look at. So make sure the setting's right. Make sure you have the right probe selected. So what we're typically going to be using for, you know, some of these deeper chest and abdominal structures is a low frequency probe. Remember, low frequency gives you lower resolution, uh, but better tissue penetration. And what we're talking about is something in about the 3 megahertz range. And it's a different talk to go into all the details of what all that means, but 3 megahertz, low frequency, gives you lower resolution but better penetration. And what we typically use is a small curvilinear or sometimes a phased array that has more of a flat surface probe. But again, more about that in another talk. Make sure that your machine settings are, you know, what you expect. So I'll just point out a couple things here. We'll note the uh, indicator right here on the left hand side of the screen that's going to correspond to a marker on your probe so make sure you know where that is and that'll help you keep your anatomy oriented uh, look over here so we see we're in the abdominal fast setting that sounds about right we're going to do a fast exam right uh, our probe this is just the name of the probe don't worry about that but look three megahertz that sounds about right that's generally what you're going to use in the abdomen something somewhere around 3, 4, 5 megahertz and then just take note of your maximum depth so our depth here is 20 centimeters and every ultrasound has these markings on the right hand side that mark off centimeters and the maximum one here is 20 so just take a glance at your machine, get in the habit of looking at these things and make sure that they are what you expect them to be and if they're not um, make them into the right settings that you want Here's the ultrasound machine we use currently in the emergency department. Um, they all have similarities and they all have differences, but there's a few buttons that they all have in common that might be in different places, but you need to find them and learn them and learn how to use them. And there's only a couple, and you can ignore the rest for the most part. So right, usually somewhere down at the bottom, you've got some kind of trackball or trackpad, just like your laptop. And then somewhere near that, you should have a set key or an enter key that is just like your mouse. So if it, this is your mouse, here's your trackball, and here's your left mouse key, and there's a duplicate over here. So that's just how you navigate things and function the computer itself. And then beyond that, you need to know where your depth key is, or depth switch, and on this particular one you push up on it and decreases the depth. As you push down it goes deeper, and that's where it is. So depth Got to know where that is. You've got to know where the gain is. So here on this machine, it's got this B mode button, which also has a dial on it. 
Now B mode is just the mode that we use for most of the ultrasound we do. It means brightness mode. It means the display is black and white dots. Again, we're not going to get into that right now, but in this particular machine, our gain dial is right there. So you can dial it up or dial it down. As you dial it up, your image gets brighter white. As you dial it down, your image gets darker black. So you need to know how to work that one so that you can make your image look more appropriate. If it's too dark or too bright, you can adjust that. Now this particular machine, and most machines these days have some type of optimize or auto gain button. You can just push that button and it should make your gain closer to what you would want. But sometimes you still have to adjust it and use this um, overall gain dial. And then lastly you saw that square come up on our store button right here. You know, hopefully you're documenting your images to put in the patient chart or so you can review them later. So you probably want to know where to hit the store button. You can store clips or still images of your ultrasound. And that's it. Forget all the rest of the images as you get good at manipulating those few buttons. Then you can start to branch out and work some of the other controls. But 90% of what you do, you just need a few buttons and those are the ones you need to know. A couple things about just basics of acquiring ultrasound images, how to hold the transducer in your hand. What I usually tell folks, for the most part, you want to hold it like it's a pencil. Like you holding a pencil on the patient and you're drawing pictures on the patient's body. As silly as that might sound, we're in kindergarten, right? Um, and really, with the once you have the probe in your hand on the patient's body, you can really only do four things. You can sweep it like a broom from side to side, or depending on how it's turned, from their head to their feet. You can kind of rock it back and forth like it's pivoting or rocking on a rocking chair. You can rotate it clockwise, counterclockwise, or you can just slide it to a different area. That's really it. But when you're doing that, pay attention to what you're doing so you can decide, did it work, did it not work, which way did I go, and then if that didn't work, let me try a different movement. And another thing that's important is a lot of the areas we're going to talk about I'm going to want you to put the probe on the patient's body and then examine that area. You don't stick it on there and take one picture and go on. You would never take one CT slice and try to make decisions based on that. Same thing with ultrasound. You don't stick it on, take one slice and keep moving. You stick it on, examine each area, and then when you have a satisfactory exam of that area, move to the next area. So think of these areas as sonographic exams. Uh, just a reference, you'll see this little man pop up multiple times here, and um, you'll hear me often refer to to having the indicator towards 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock or 9 o'clock, and this is just to give you that reference point for what we're going to be talking about. In ultrasound, for the most part, we are going to have the indicator on our transducer directed either towards the head, which will give us sagittal views, or towards the patient's right, which will give us transverse cuts or axial cuts, very similar to CT cuts. And you can kind of see those here. We've got the indicator towards the patient's head. We're taking a slice down through their body. And we're taking that slice and display that on the machine. So that their head is here, their feet are here. This is anterior, and this is posterior. In this example here, we have the indicator marker towards the patient's right-hand side. We're taking a slice down through their body. Here you can see what it's like here. We get a cross section. And then we just take that cross sectional wedge, display that on the machine. So the right side, left side, anterior, posterior. Now, sometimes we'll change this up and we'll do more of oblique images or coronal views, but you'll you'll get the feel for what those look like as you see them. So the fast exam. There's six parts of it. it. may sound like a lot, but as you get practiced and better at it, you can do this in about three minutes and often less. And here's the way I approach it that I think makes sense and helps me be more efficient and get it done quickly. So I start with the views of the chest, right and left. So that's one and two. And that's looking for a pneumothorax. I'm going to show you that. And then I move into the heart. So that's number three. And I usually go to the right side. And that's number four, where I'm looking above the diaphragm and around Morrison's pouch, pericolic gutters. Now I look in the same d general areas on the left side, so that's number five. And then number six, look in the pelvis. And that's pretty much it. That's the FAST exam. Six views, 
um, some views with modifications, but you can do it in a few minutes once you get practice. It doesn't take that long. Now this guy over here is just to help show that often when you have the probe on the patient's side, it helps to turn the indicator towards the bed a little bit to help you get around ribs so that they don't get in the way of your imaging. So here it is in writing. Again, we start with the anterior chest. We do right and left. We do the heart. Then we examine several areas on the right. We examine several, several areas on the left. And then we go to the pelvis. And then we're done. So let's talk about how to do it. Let's start with that anterior chest. Looking for pneumothorax. And that's it. That's our question. Pneumothorax, yes or no. Nothing else we're asking here. So how do we do this? We put the transducer on the patient's chest with the indicator towards their head in about the third or fourth intercostal space in the mid clavicular line. Key thing, on your machine you want to decrease your depth and I'll show you that here in a second. And this is our question. Is there sliding? Yes or no? Sliding is normal. The absence of sliding indicates pneumothorax. Here's some examples. So these are images that are taken with a high frequency transducer, but I'm going to show you the low frequency transducer that you will more commonly use here in a moment. So notice a couple things. Our depth, 4 centimeters. So we're looking very superficial in the chest. This is all chest wall here, stationary, it's not really moving. Here we've got our rib, here we've got our rib. And here we have that interface of the visceral and parietal pleura. And that's where you see sliding, and that's what's normal. You see this sliding movement that's different than the chest wall, and you see these comet tail artifacts streaking down vertically. That's normal sliding. Over here we see something similar. We've got chest wall, rib, rib, pleural sliding, and comet tail artifacts. That's normal. That's what sliding looks like. If you see that, there's no pneumothorax in that area. Now, most of the time for the FAST exam, we're using a lower frequency transducer. I'll go back to those last images for a minute and just take a look there. See, we've got this 8 megahertz transducer. We go to our next images. Now we're on a 3 megahertz transducer, but we've decreased our depth six centimeters because we want to look superficial and that's just as superficial as that will go doesn't look quite as pretty but here's the chest wall and in this particular instance you want to be holding your hand very steady so that you don't confuse your movement for moving in the chest and here we see that pleural sliding going across the chest so that indicates the absence of a pneumothorax here again chest wall and we've got that pleural sliding. We've got ribs right off on the edges on each side here. There's a rib over here and a rib over here. We usually try to move those off the screen. And we can see these normal looking sliding lung signs. Now, here's an example. I'm going to go ahead and put them up here. Pneumothorax over here and normal over here. Again, this is high frequency, 4 centimeters. We've got chest wall, rib, rib, pleural sliding, comet tail artifacts. That's normal. On this side, we can see the whole chest is moving because their muscles are moving their chest, but there is no sliding there. See that? You look right at that pleural line, look for those artifacts, look for that sparkly movement across here, and it's not there. So. This is pneumothorax and this is normal. And it's nice sometimes you just compare sides and hopefully one side is normal. It's not always normal, but hopefully one side is normal. And that gives you a nice comparison. But again, usually for the FAST exam we have in our hand a low frequency transducer. And here's what things look like. Here's the, put the words up, normal side, sliding here. And that's the key. Just look for that line, look for that sliding lung, then look over here. There is nothing going on. It's like a still image almost. So this is pneumothorax, and this is normal. Tells you yes, no, doesn't tell you the size. 
So just a little bit of literature on this because this is something that's sometimes met with skepticism and it's it's a newer thing, ultrasound for pneumothorax, but in studies of trauma patients it's more sensitive than that AP supine chest x-ray that we get a lot of the time. Now there's other good information in that chest x-ray, I don't think we abandon it, but I like to do the ultrasound of the chest first because it gives me better information quicker. Um, and you can see the sensitivities there, ultrasound 98% versus the AP chest x-ray of 75%. And in these studies it showed you get the diagnosis quicker and you're able to get them treated quicker. So that's the chest for pneumothorax. Next I move to the heart to look for hemopericardium. And again, yes or no question. Is there blood around the heart? Yes or no? And here's how you do this. You've got your transducer in your hand. You've got it in a transverse orientation right under about a centimeter underneath the xiphoid process in this particular scenario you have your hand on top so that you can smash that thing flat down on their abdomen you've got your indicator towards the patient's right and you're shooting that ultrasound beam up into their chest trying to get a view of their heart and sometimes it can help you to have them take a deep breath pushing the heart down towards your transducer into the view so your indicator is towards about nine o'clock and that's the question. A fusion, blood, around the heart, yes or no. And here's what it normally is going to look like, uh, except it doesn't usually have labels on it. We've got the liver right here. We can see a little bit of it's kind of homogeneous and gray. And the closest thing to your transducer is the right ventricle. So that's what you're going to see. The first chamber, then the right atrium is here. Interventricular septum, here's the left ventricle left atrium, you can see the mitral valve flapping there, and then the bright white pericardium wrapping around the heart without any fluid inside of it. And here's a still image showing fluid in the pericardium. I'll just outline that there. So fluid, remember fluid on ultrasound is generally black, that's why the blood inside the heart is black, and then the blood outside the heart is going to be black. And here's a live image of pericardial fusion, black fluid wrapping around the heart. You see that in your trauma patient, then you got to think I need to optimize their volume so get plenty of volume in them and then you may need to think about pericardiocentesis versus thoracotomy. Briefly going to talk about an alternate view of the heart. You can get the parasternal long axis view called that because the probe is placed next to the sternum and you're getting long axis views of the heart. Place the probe in about the third or fourth intercostal space. The indicator should be directed towards their left kidney at about 3.30. And um, you usually have to slide up and down the sternum a little bit until you find the heart. And here's what it's going to look like. Now, take note. The heart differs its orientation. Now the base of the heart is on this side of the screen and our apex is over on this side of the screen. And what's very visible in this view is the left ventricle, but you can see the pericardium wrapping all around the heart and hopefully you see the absence of pericardial fusion. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that. So you've looked at the chest for pneumothorax, you've looked at the heart for hemopericardium. Next you're going to look at the right side of the abdomen and up into the chest for hemothorax and hemoperitoneum. Here's how you're going to do this. And you notice the way that they're holding the probe, stabilizing it on the patient's body. You're going to have the indicator towards their head. You're going to come across about the level of the xiphoid and about the anterior or mid axillary line. And uh, sometimes you may oblique your indicator towards more like 11 o'clock to get between the ribs and you're gonna this is where it's very important to examine these areas you're gonna sweep from floor to the ceiling you want to make sure you examine from above the diaphragm into Morrison's pouch and then come down below the kidney into the right pericolic gutter and in each area again you want to sweep through and examine each area very well so you're gonna start so find the diaphragm first diaphragm's easy to see it's nice bright white arcing dome and usually it's sitting above some kind of organ like the liver. Up in the lung you're not going to see much of anything except a gray reflection unless there's blood then it's going to look black. You see the organ here again another example here's your bright white diaphragm above you just see gray which is normal 
you've got your organ, you're even starting to see the top of the kidney and a bit, a little bit of Morrison's pouch here. A couple more examples. These are on the left side. Bright white diaphragm looking above. Bright white diaphragm look above. And here's what blood or fluid in the chest is going to look like. It's going to look black. So you find that diaphragm and look for black stuff above it. And it's if it's there, it's generally pretty easy to see. See those examples there. Then you're just going to slide your same place, anterior or mid-axillary line. You're just going to slide towards the patient's feet a little bit. Uh, sometimes past another rib. And then you want to find on the right side Morrison's pouch. Morrison's pouch is that potential space there between the kidney and the liver. And when it's normal, you don't see much of anything there. And again, you want to examine this whole area, sweep it from the floor to the ceiling to examine this area completely. And when it's abnormal, you'll see black stuff. That's blood where it doesn't belong inside the abdomen. Here's another example. Blood. There's kidney. There's liver. That's a rib shadow there. you got blood in Morrison's pouch. Here are a couple more subtle examples. Just a little black stripe. A little tiny black stripe there, but if you examine that area well, you'll pick it up if it's there. Same place, you're in the anterior or mid-axillary line. Just slide below the lower pole of that kidney, and then again, sweep the probe from the floor to the ceiling, and you'll find the pericolic gutter. You know you're looking at the pericolic gutter when you see this bright white roly-poly stuff. That's bowel gas within the bowel, and then the bowel gas shadows everything out. Here you see this pumped up air lining the intestinal wall and then shadows. That's the normal pericolic gutter. There's nothing there. Uh, when it's abnormal, it's pretty striking. And here's what it lo looks like when it's abnormal. Here's again that bowel. Here's the fluid. Blood inside the abdomen showing up in the pericolic gutter. Again, here's that bowel. There's the fluid outlining the bowel in the pericolic gutter couple more examples. Here's one where Morrison's pouch back here looked very clear, but as you slid down below the kidney, you see that blood in the pericolic gutter. And the same thing over here. That black stuff is blood. So then you go to the left side. So that was the right side, looking for hemothorax, hemoperitoneum. Left side, you're looking for the same thing. The technique is very similar, except on the left side, the kidney and the spleen and the diaphragm are a little higher and a little more posterior to get the best imaging. So the indicator is going to be towards their head and about the posterior axillary line, the level of the sternum. And you're going to, again, each area you're going to sweep from floor to ceiling. You want to find the diaphragm. Look above it. You want to find the spleen and the kidney. You want to examine all the spleen if you can and then come down below that lower pole of the left kidney and find the left pericolic gutter. And in this area, most of the time your indicator is going to be directed about uh, 1 o'clock, 1.30ish. And when it's normal, here's what it's going to look like. Very important, find this diaphragm over here. This is normal, there's nothing up here. We've got spleen, there's the diaphragm, there's the lung, there's the spleen, left kidney in view. I'm going to move down, you can kind of focus more at that spleen and kidney area for a second. You see the diaphragm, spleen, all nice and homogeneous and gray. There's the kidney. You don't see any black stuff that doesn't belong there. Here's when it's abnormal, and here's why it's important to find that diaphragm. On the left side, blood likes to go between the diaphragm and the spleen. There's not really much of a potential space in the spleno-renal recess. So this is where the blood goes on the left side. So make sure you find that diaphragm. There it is. There's blood around the spleen. You're also looking at the chest. Don't see a whole lot. Maybe there's a little bit of fluid there. Look for that perisplenic fluid. Then, again, just like on the right side, slide down below the kidney on the left. Find the pericolic gutters. I'm not going to spend much more time dwelling on those. Here's more examples of abnormal pericolic gutters. Again, with blood outlining the intestines couple more examples, but very important because sometimes this is the only place you're going to see the blood. So you've done the chest for pneumothorax, you've done the heart for hemopericardium, you've done the right and left sides looking for hemothorax and hemoperitoneum, 
Then you're going to go to the pelvis. This is another window into the peritoneum to look for blood. Way to get this pelvic window, it's always lower than you think it is. You're going to place your probe just superior to the pubic symphysis with your indicator directed towards the patient's right. And then you're going to sweep from their feet to their head until you usually you're going to use the bladder as your landmark or if they have a Foley catheter in, you're going to try to find the balloon. And in females, very important to also identify their uterus and sweep all the way up past it because fluid goes into the pouch of Douglas in the female. And here's what it's going to look like. Your transverse views are just going to show you if the bladder still has something in it. A black bag. And you're looking for blood around the edges and at the bottom. Here's a sagittal view. You've got some artifact in here that's just normal stuff. But the bladder is a black bag of urine. Most of our patients have the courtesy to have a few beers before they come in, so their bladders are usually nice and full. A couple more normal examples. Again, there's a little bit of artifact streaking through here, but you've got the outline of a nice black looking normal bladder. Nothing behind it. Here's a sagittal view. Here's the bladder. Here's the outline of the uterus indenting on that bladder. So this is a female patient. And here's what it looks like when it's abnormal. So here we have the uterus in a female patient. So we've already swept past the bladder and we've identified fluid behind the uterus. Again, find the uterus in the female because fluid is going to be behind the uterus a lot of the time. Here's a sagittal view of the bladder. Here's the dome of the bladder and you see blood within the peritoneum. More examples. Transverse views. You see the blood, kind of that stripe behind the bladder. And here again, fluid blood behind the bladder in this patient. Female pelvis. I said it before. I'm just going to show you an example. Here's the bladder. Supporting ligaments on the side. This is normal. But as you keep sweeping towards the head, you find the uterus and you find hemoperitoneum. That's why you got to find the uterus in the females. That's where the blood's going to be. So, again, just summarizing, we do the right and left anterior chest, looking for the pneumothorax. We do the heart, looking for hemopericardium. Right side, looking for hemothorax or hemoperitoneum. Left side, looking for the same things. And then we go to the pelvis, looking for hemoperitoneum. Those are all the views in the FAST exam. And I want you to get lots and lots of practice doing this so that you can do it in under three minutes couple of summary points about just techniques. Most of the time you want to hold the probe in your hand like it's a pencil when you're drawing pictures on the patient. So, you know, make it like kindergarten art class. Have fun with it. Be systematic. You'll be better at this and you'll gain skills more quickly if you do it the same way every time. And you don't have to do it the way I've outlined it. It's just the way I do it. It's the way that makes sense to me. And I do it the same every time so that I'm uh, quicker at doing it. And remember, especially on those abdominal views, you're examining these areas, and you're not just sticking and shooting a picture. And so an exam really is sticking the transducer on the patient and really moving it fully through all the cardinal directions to examine that area. Now, when you're looking at things that are moving, like the heart and the sliding chest, it's kind of important actually to stick, find your right spot and then hold very still so that you can pick up subtle movement that's hard to see. Uh, just reminders about some of the things, the things that can get in the way or pitfalls of the FAST exam. Remember, pneumothorax, not quantified. It's yes or no question, and it, there's nothing about how big. The bleeding site, not necessarily identified. Blood in the abdomen does not necessarily mean blood from spleen or blood from liver. You don't know. There's no blood in the abdomen. Uh, the retroperitoneum, poorly imaged. So if the retroperitoneal injury is on the list, you got to do something else. Either think about DPL versus if they're stable enough, they can do a triple phase CT scan. Um, incorporate the FAST exam into the history physical, your primary survey. Remember, FAST exam is only one piece of information in the evaluation of your trauma patient. So don't forget about the things you saw on exam, the things you know about their mechanism of injury. It's one piece of information, but a useful piece. Incorporate it appropriately. So, most important things to do with the FAST exam, you've got to get good images so that you can make good decisions. So it's important to get good images, but the 
reason you want good images is so you can make the right decisions. So the most important role for the FAST exam is in the unstable patient. A patient who's in shock, they're tachycardic, they're hypotensive. And here's a couple of quick and easy equations of the FAST exam. You've got a patient who's in shock, they're unstable, and you see the absence of sliding. So I'm going to outline here. Absent sliding, that means they got a pneumothorax. If they have a pneumothorax and they're unstable, you need to stick a needle in their chest, and then you got to follow that with a chest tube. It's easy. you got to do it. There's no, there's no other answer. If the patient's unstable, they're in shock, and you see blood around their heart here, then they need to pericardiocentesis or thoracotomy. Now, of course, you're going to follow your other general resuscitative measures. Make sure their volume status is good. Make sure you've got fluid and blood going in. But if they are unstable or continue unstable, they need a definitive procedure, or a more definitive procedure. If they're unstable and they've got hemothorax, then they need a chest tube and quite possibly a thoracotomy. So again, resuscitate, evaluate, make your decisions. If they are unstable and you see blood in their abdomen, they need an exploratory laparotomy. They should not go to CT scan. They shouldn't get a DPL. They should go for an x lap Another important point. FAST exam. You've got a patient with significant respiratory symptoms. They're tachypneic. They're hypoxic. And you see absent sliding. That means they've got pneumothorax and they need a chest tube. Maybe you need to needle or chest first. You've got to make that decision based on how sick they are. You don't wait for the chest x-ray, don't wait for CT scan. If they've got signs of significant respiratory distress and you see a pneumothorax, fix it. You don't need to know how big it is. Just put a chest tube in. Now, stable patient. This is the patient who doesn't have significant respiratory symptoms and they're not in shock. If you see a pneumothorax, meaning that you don't see sliding, but they're stable, their respiratory status is good, and they're not in shock, then you can wait. You can get a chest x-ray. Maybe you can go ahead and get a CT scan and see how big it is and see if you can just watch it. That's okay thing to do. If they're stable, they've got hemothorax, you may not need to put a chest tube in right away, although maybe you need to, but you should think about that patient very differently. They're in the compensated shock category because they're bleeding in their chest, so you need to aggressively resuscitate them, probably get more imaging, and they need much more close closer monitoring than maybe your kind of run-of-the-mill not-so-sick trauma patient. If they're stable and they have hemoperitoneum, again, you've got to consider that patient to be in compensated shock. Even though their vital signs look good now, they're ble actively bleeding in their abdomen, or at least they were bleeding in their abdomen at some point, you need to be very careful with that patient. Close monitoring, aggressive resuscitation, probably more imaging to further delineate their injuries. This is how the FAST exam still helps you in the stable patient. It can tell you all these things quickly at the bedside that nothing else can tell you at the bedside. A few more pearls about the FAST exam. Practice systematically. Do it, try to do it the same every time. Pay attention to your hand and the transducer and what it's doing on the patient's body and how it correlates with the images you're getting on the screen. Remember the areas we talked about, examine them. Don't just shoot a picture and move on. And then remember the FAST exams, non-invasive, no radiation, no contrast, doesn't hurt anything. So if the patient's status changes, repeat it. Do it again and see if something is different that you didn't see before. So with that, I want to go ahead and go into a couple of cases. So here's our first case. We've got an 18-year-old male. He's involved in a motor vehicle crash. He's got abdominal pain. Now, obviously, I'm leaving out a lot of things that we do because we're talking about the FAST exam today. Of course, we're doing ABCs. We're doing primary survey. We're getting two large bore IVs. And then, as part of our primary survey, we're also doing the FAST exam. So, let's see. What do we see here on this patient? We've got, um, so he's hypotensive, right? Blood pressure is 87 over palp, his heart rate's 126, so this patient's, what, in shock, right? So, patient in shock. On the left side here, we see sliding, so no pneumothorax. We've got sliding here, no pneumo, no pericardial effusion. Here's the left side, and these aren't all the images, but these are representative, representative images. 
looks pretty good over here again we probably need some more images but what we got here looks good here's the bladder and look at that we've got blood in the abdomen so this patient is got unstable vital signs we've got hemoperitoneum so what are we going to do oh and then we get that last image some reason we stopped with the right and there we've got blood in Morrison's pouch so again unstable vital signs blood in the abdomen what's the answer what's our decision here's our decision making algorithm is the patient stable or unstable what do you think unstable do they have pneumothorax nope so do we need to do a needle thoracostomy not this time do they have hemopericardium not this time so do we need to do pericardiocentesis or thoracotomy no does the patient have hemothorax? Well, we didn't show those images very well in that last slide, uh, but I probably would have showed them to you if they were abnormal, so we're going to say no. Uh, so do we need a chest tube or thoracotomy again? Probably no. Uh, do we have hemoperitoneum? Uh, yeah, we do. Our patient's unstable, hemoperitoneum. Answer is laparotomy. And that's it. Those are the questions you go through in your FAST exam you're trying to answer every time. So patients unstable with hemoperitoneum, they get a laparotomy. Got to remember that not only for life, but this is the most frequently tested question about the FAST exam on your shelf. Now let's move on to our next patient. So case number two, we've got a 17 year old female. She's had an MVC as well. Lots of people in car wrecks today. She's uh, Hypotensive, her blood pressure is 89 over palp, her heart rate is 86, resps are 32, so she's a little tachypnic, she's a little hypoxic, and um, breast sounds aren't so good on the left. What do we got? Well, um, here's her left chest. There's some movement going on, but as I look along this line, I'm not really seeing anything. Over here I've got sliding on the right side. Uh, heart looks pretty good, there's no fluid around it. Here's one of my images from the right. Morrison's pouch looks good. Above the diaphragm looks pretty good. Uh, here's the bladder. Don't see anything going on there. There's some other images we left off for uh, keeping them all on the slide's sake. But uh, we got an unstable patient, pneumothorax. So what should we do? Well, let's go through our algorithm. You can tell me, but we'll go through it. Stable or unstable? Unstable. Pneumothorax. Yes. So what are we going to do? Needle thoracostomy. We're going to follow that with a chest tube. Uh, do they have hemopericardium? No. So we're not going to do pericardiocentesis or thoracotomy. Hemothorax, at least not in the images we saw. So we're going to say no. We're not going to do those things. Because uh, we already decided to do a chest tube earlier. There's hemoperitoneum. No, we don't see that. So uh, we don't need a laparotomy right now. But we do the chest tube, things change. We may have to repeat the fast and then see if there's something else. So, unstable patient plus pneumothorax equals needle thoracostomy. Follow that up with your chest tube. Alright, so we got another case here. Make sure all of our movies are playing. This is a 20 year old female, fell out of a window downtown. There was a party. And she needed some air and then she tripped and fell. She's uh, unstable. Blood pressure is 76 over pal. Heart rate is 132. Uh, Refs are 14. Pulse ox is 98. And we've got some representative images again. We've got uh, sliding. Sliding. So no pneumothorax. Heart looks pretty good. The right side above the diaphragm and Morrison's here. That looks pretty good. We've got our right paracolic gutter. Don't see any blood in there. Left above the diaphragm looks good. I don't see any fluid anywhere around the spleen. We've got some more images. We showed pretty much all of her images here. There's the left paracolic gutter. Don't see blood. Here's her bladder. There's the uterus back there. I don't see blood back there. There's a trans or sagittal view no blood so this is looking like a pretty negative fast exam we got an unstable patient negative fast so she's unstable but there's no pneumo so we can save her from a needle or a hole in her chest 
Uh, she doesn't have blood around her heart, so we don't need to do a needle to her heart or open her chest cracked open. That's good. Uh, hemothorax, no, we didn't see that. So again, she doesn't need holes in her chest. No blood in her abdomen. Hmm, so why is she in, why is she in shock? Uh, didn't need a laparotomy. So, you got an unstable patient, a negative fast. Now this is a good fast. If you're if you can't get good images, then maybe you're just missing something. But if you have quality images and a complete fast exam, and it doesn't tell you the cause of shock, got to think about some of the other causes. Remember, there are other things that cause shock in the trauma patient, and usually the first thing on the list has got to be bleeding. So things that the fast doesn't tell you so much about. Is she bleeding in her mediastinum, her retroperitoneum, bleeding into the retroperitoneal areas of the pelvis, long bones, remember mid-shaft femur fractures can bleed a lot. Is this spinal shock? Well, probably got to rule out all the other bleeding causes first. Uh, is this cardiogenic shock? And you can use ultrasound to actually help you with that, beyond what we're going to talk about today. Uh, this patient so this is an example of where you've got to think about the whole, the entire clinical picture. I didn't tell you her whole primary survey. We did A, B, C, D, E's. We did primary survey that included the FAST, uh, but we also found evidence of a pretty obvious left femur fracture, and that's where she was bleeding from. So she had to be resuscitated and then get that stabilized to decrease the bleeding. So we've got here our fourth case. This is a 37-year-old man in a motor vehicle crash. Blood pressure is 136 over 74. Heart rate is 96. Rest for 20. Pulse ox is 98. So this is a stable patient. Um, but remember, I said we do the fast exam in our stable patients again because it still gives us extra information that the rest of our primary survey doesn't give us. Uh, so we see sliding. It's like sliding. So no pneumo, no fluid around the heart. Oh, we've got blood in the abdomen. We see some there in Morrison's. To the left, it looks pretty good. But we've got some blood in the pelvis. We've got a stable patient. So what, what, is, what do we do with that? So, here's our decisions. Stable, unstable. We'll go through all these. Pretty much it's stable and a bunch of no's until we get to hemoperitoneum. And then the answer is yes. But does this person need a laparotomy? they're stable so the answer is not right now but this is a patient that needs more of your attention than some of your other patients they've got hemoperitoneum so they were bleeding or maybe still are bleeding in their abdomen even though their vital signs are compensated so this is you've got to consider this person to be in compensated shock aggressively resuscitate them closely monitor them and you can go ahead and send this person to CT scan to further delineate their injuries and make more decisions but if their vital signs start to go down the tubes while you're in CT scan, then maybe you need to go ahead up to the operating room. So even in the stable patient, valuable information about your trauma patient by ultrasound. So I'll try to leave the cases at that, summarize a little bit, a quality fast. So remember, ultrasound and all imaging relies on the quality of the images you obtain quality fast exam adds valuable information to your primary survey. It's quick, it's bedside, really no downside whatsoever. Remember you can make four diagnoses or exclude four diagnoses with the fast exam with ultrasound. Pneumo, hemothorax, hemopericardium, and hemoperitoneum. Don't try to make more or exclude more diagnoses than that. The unstable patient is where it's most critical to make immediate decisions whether they need holes in their chest, holes towards their heart, a big slice in their chest, or a big slice in their abdomen. In the unstable patient, fast exam can direct you pretty quickly into one of those decisions or multiple decisions there. In the stable patient, the fast exam adds to your primary survey, so do your primary survey, do that with quality, and then do a quality fast exam, and then maybe you can be a little bit more selective about your CT scans, or you can be alerted to more severe injuries than you initially suspected. In the patients who have a negative fast who are stable, you might consider going ahead and doing a CT scan if they're high risk because they're altered or intoxicated. You've got objective signs like a big 
abrasion or contusion or ecchymosis across their abdomen or they just have severe pain, persistent pain, their labs look abnormal, they're, they're dropping their hemoglobin, they're acidotic, or they looked okay at first, they're starting to not look so good, or you've done a repeat fast exam and it's changed, and you want to go ahead and do a CT scan on that person. But with a strategy like that, you can cut out some of your CT scans on the stable trauma patients. And I think that's everything I got for you. Thanks for your time and attention. Email me any of your questions, and I look forward to seeing you in the trauma bay. Thanks.